morning. It's great to see you here this morning. And uh, yeah, I, uh, as you came in this morning, I don't know if you noticed it. Some of you I saw stop and look, and then others, you know, were like really quick to try and get to your seats. And uh, but I set up a little uh, a little spot at the back, and it has a cross and a mirror and a, a bottle, a thing of water, and a time of uh, of reflecting. And so I'm going to talk about that this morning a little bit. Last week I spoke on prayer, and I spoke about how uh, Jesus said that my house shall be a house of prayer. And now, as you know, that if you are a believer of Christ, if you are a follower of Christ, that Christ actually, God says that you now have become the house of God. And so that means that Christ is living, God is living within our hearts, within our lives. And so if we take those two and mix them together, then we should be, as the house of God, we should be people of prayer. And uh, as people of prayer, we should live our lives desiring to talk to God, to communicate with him, to, to worship him through um, this aspect of prayer. So, I have a question for you then, and I want you to be honest. Uh, You don't have to say it out loud, but I want you to be honest to yourself. Have you struggled with your prayer life recently? Have you ever come to a point in your life where you really struggle with with getting down on your knees and, and praying for a long period of time? You know, for me, I I can there's some times where I can just come into God's presence and be um, just loving the time of talking with him. And then there's other times where I come into his presence and I, I sit down on the couch and I start to pray and about two hours later, I wake up. <laughs> and there are times where our prayer life, for me, can can just feel like it's a struggle. So why do we pray? Someone answer me. Why do we pray? Because Jesus prayed. prayed. Why else? Because God answers answers our prayers. Why else do we pray? A relationship. We're in a relationship with him. So it's a two-way, back and forth communication. Why else do we pray? Yes. Yes, yeah, so we bring our requests to God when we're, when we're struggling, when we, have, when we have problems, we bring our requests to him and he answers. Well, God's, so, so these are all good answers of why we pray. God says it's our lifeline um, and we gain spiritual strength um, through our prayer. And that's what people do when they're in love. They communicate with each other. And if, if God loves us and we love him, it should be something that we do. Well, you know, I'm a visual person. I like to see things and I like models and, and um, uh, learning how to do things by visual means. Now, this week, uh, it's been really hot for the last little while. I don't know if you've noticed that. Um, but, and my wife's van, her power window broke. And... That would be great if it was down, but it was sort of half down and half open, and she couldn't lock the van, and she's going away uh, on holidays, and so wherever she went, she had to leave her van unlocked, and I didn't really think this was safe for my family, so I took it to the shop, and I asked them to replace the window, and they told me that it was going to be between three and five hundred dollars to replace the window. Uh, just the motor in the window. And I was like, ah, I can't really afford that right now. So I took it home and I went on YouTube. And on YouTube, there is instructions on how to fix just about everything on your car. And it's pretty cool. So I sat there and I watched the video and my mom's van is uh, dead and it's waiting to be picked up uh, by a wrecker. And so I went out and I thought, well, let's take this thing apart and see, because I've seen the visual of how this works. So I took the panel off and I, 
After about an hour and a half later, which probably was a 10 minute job, I had this motor out and in my hand. And then when Bev came home, I took her van and I took it apart and I put it back together. And she texted me the other day as she was driving, well, she probably waited till she got where she was going and then texted me from her drive saying, it's so cool, the window works. And we have been created to be visual people. Now, if I read that in a book or someone, or if I just looked at the van and thought, I wouldn't have been able to figure that out. Well, God has given us a design, a model of worship in his word of how we are to worship him, how we are to praise and, and give him glory. Creation, um, some say, may have been one of God's greatest uh, achievements, you know, because he spoke the world into existence. But in scripture, we see 40 verses talking about creation. And yet, this model of worship, we see over 4,000 verses within the Old Testament and, and referenced in the New Testament about this model of worship that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai, the tabernacle. And so this morning, I would like to take and have you walk through the tabernacle with me. If we go to the next slide, uh, this was what Moses, this is a model of what Moses was instructed to uh, build for the children of Israel to come into uh, their act of worship in the desert and in the wilderness as they were going to the promised land. And... As, as you take a look at that, and you all have, will have one in your um, bulletins as well, um, they, this was to serve, um, they, the priest served at the sanctuary, and it is a copy of the shadow of what was in heaven. And so Moses was told, and that was, Moses was told that he was to build this tabernacle in a very specific manner right down to the actual measurements of how he was to build it, how he was to construct it. And so uh, it had a gate and it had the altar and then the laver and then into the holy place and then uh, a veil and into the holy of holies. And there was a whole instruction on how the children of Israel were to come with their sacrifices. They were to come to meet with God. They were to, to uh, meet with a priest who would then take their offering um, into the holy place and then the high priest would take it onto the mercy seat where we would find forgiveness and we would find our relationship with God in that place. And Jesus said when he was here, when he was talking to Nicodemus, he said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And so as we come to this model of worship, we come to the gate and we see Jesus as the gate, the way into the very presence of God. And so for the next two weeks, we're going to look at this design for worship as laid out in the Old Testament and, in, and as it's referenced in the New Testament as well in Hebrews 8 Verse 5, it described as this verse was up here, um, how the tabernacle is a shadow or of a copy of what is in heaven. And that Moses was to meticulously construct and handle everything as instructed by God on the mountain. Now one of the, in this tabernacle, the people who did the work in the tabernacle were the priests. They would take your offering and they would um, do all of the right things so that you experience forgiveness. And they were the only ones that were allowed to go into the holy place and to um, experience that, that presence of God as the, uh, the pillar of cloud came down upon that tabernacle. And, uh, and God's very presence was right in that holy place. Only the priests could go. But under this new covenant that we now live in this New Testament time, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it states that every believer is now a priest. And we all have the privilege and ability to approach the throne of grace whenever we need to at any time. 
But unfortunately, when we have something that's available to us at all times, in every place, sometimes we take it for granted. When Paul says we're to pray without ceasing, sometimes we can take that ability to be able to come into the very presence of God and it can almost become mundane. And now I know there's a lot of us who just love, who, who really resist that and don't, and, sh- and struggle to keep our prayer life active and exciting. But I would encourage you to create, treat coming into the presence of God as a privilege. As a priest of God, it is a privilege to be able to come into his presence. You know, I saw a, a t-shirt a while ago and it said, Jesus is my homeboy. And it's funny, yeah. But he's not my homeboy. He may be my friend, and he may have a close relationship, but he's not just that. He is so much more. He's God Almighty. And sometimes we look at prayer, and we think of, of prayer as God is our vending machine. If I, if, I, if I want a new car, I'm going to pray for a new car. If I want a new job, I'm going to pray for a new job. If someone's got a health issue, I'm going to pray for that. And we leave it at just that. We, we come to God with all of our requests, and we forget the other aspects of of who God is, and yet he's laid it out so clo- clo- clearly in this model of the tabernacle. It is his design for worship for us here on earth, and it is a copy of what is in heaven. So this morning, let's approach God in worship through this model of prayer. In the tabernacle, I see over and over and over again, as I've shared with you before, uh, a, the model of Christ laid out and Christ identifying himself with the tabernacle as, as we go, th- as the people of Israel would have known the whole tabernacle worship. He wouldn't have had to explain it that much. So when he said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, people would have grasped it that he was the way. When he said in John chapter 10, verse 9, I am the door to the sheep. People would have understood it. And so as we came, as you came in this morning, you came to a curtain that was open. Now, it wasn't the right colors, but it's what I had to work with. And as you came to that curtain, I wanted it to represent the door, the gateway to coming in to the tabernacle. And Jesus said that no man comes to the Father except through me. And we can't come to the tabernacle. We can't come into God's presence. We, we have no way of getting to that holy place without coming through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he said that many will try to come a different way, will we'll preach a different gospel. Thieves will break in and steal. They're trying to come in a different way than, rather than coming through the gate through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that today. We see uh, churches that teach that there's other ways that you can get to God. We see churches that, that teach that all ways lead to God. And yet Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So we see teachings like that of the Mormons or the, or the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses that, that claim to be Christian, and yet they, they claim a different way. And yet right in Scripture, we see this model that there was one way. That was through this gate. The one other thing I love about this gate is that it was 30 feet wide. So it didn't matter the size of your sin, you could bring it to God. And it didn't matter what you had, what your um, ability was to bring an offering to God. Maybe you were super rich and you had tons of sheep and you could pick your very best lamb and you could bring that as your offering and, and God wanted you to do that. But let's just say you couldn't afford that. Well, then Scripture gives you options to bring a, a, a couple doves. And you could bring those doves as your offering. But may, maybe you didn't have any, enough money to bring doves. So then you were allowed to bring a grain offering as your sacrifice 
for your sins. And if you couldn't afford the grain offering, what did God put on the ground every day when you were in the wilderness? He put manna there. You were able to bake cakes and bring those as your offering. There was nothing that stood in the way of you being able to come through this gate and come to present your offering to God. The fence around the tabernacle was made of fine linen. And this fine white linen um, was all the way around and it came to this gate which was embroidered with scarlet and purple and blue. And now as we look back, we see the characters of Christ, even in these colors. The pure, white, spotless Lamb of God. The red, the scarlet, as His blood paid the penalty for our sins. The purple, because he is our King of kings and Lord of lords. And the blue, because he left heaven to come to earth, as Philippians chapter, um, as Philippians chapter 2 says in verses 5 to 11, that he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he came. He took on the very nature of a servant and became obedient unto death. So as we come into the temple, I'm going to do something that we're not used to in a sermon. And I want you to take and look at that picture or or look at that, that, that curtain and take a moment. Leave the hustle and bustle of the world behind you at the gate and step through by faith in Jesus Christ. Separate yourself from the distractions and be still and know that he is God. I'd like you to bow your heads and just picture yourself stepping through those beautiful curtains and then talk to God. Give praise to him. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Father God, I thank you that we have this ability to come into worship, that we have a way that leads to a relationship with you. I thank you that Jesus is the gate. He is the door. And whosoever would come can find life, can find relationship, can find truth can find a way unto you, Father God. I thank you in your precious name. Amen. So after you've walked through the gate and you've come into this temple, this tabernacle setting, the first item that you're going to see is a brazen alt- altar. This is an altar where the sacrifice would be offered, would be burnt upon a fire here. And This is where the innocent died for the guilty, where a substitute was sacrificed after becoming identified with the transgressions of the guilty party, and in doing so, taking his or her punishment upon itself. And again, we see Jesus as part of this plan. We see Jesus, our sacrifice, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, put upon a cross so that he could become sin for us. He was sacrificed for their sins once and for all, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 27 says. This tabernacle altar was a foreshadowing of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you came with your lamb to the altar, The priest would have you put your hand upon the head of the lamb and then they would kill the lamb. 
And as you put your hand upon the head of that lamb, your sins were symbolically transferred to that lamb because the wages of sin is death. That lamb was put to death and it was a sacrifice for your sins. Your sins were taken and put upon this lamb. So as we come to the cross, we need to come with a repentant heart. We need to come with a heart of asking God to, to, to forgive us, to cleanse us. And so again, I want to ask you as we take this prayer journey this morning, as we come to this cross, to take a moment and to bow your heads in prayer in just a moment. and gay, or, or you don't even have to. You could look at the picture up here of the cross of, of Christ. Or at the back. And as you gaze upon this cross with a repentant heart, picture Jesus there with you at the cross. Think about the fact that he took your place. And as you picture that, and pray, I'm going to softly read some scripture to you about the cross and about his sacrifice. In Isaiah 59, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you. But now, in Romans 6, 22, but now you have been set free from sin. Praise God. And you have become slaves of God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness. And the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus our Lord. Ephesians chapter 2. Remember that at a time, at one time, you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of promise, without hope, without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. as you gaze upon this cross, as you watch, walk through this tabernacle, this is the part where you leave your sin. Because we have this ability to leave it. And as Christ was nailed to the cross, so we see that our sins are nailed to that cross. So Father God, I thank you that we can find forgiveness at the cross. Lord Jesus, thank you for leaving heaven and coming to earth and living a perfect life so that you could be the spotless lamb of God. Thank you for taking my sin and allowing me passage to eternity, allowing me an opportunity to follow the way to the Father. Amen. So as we come to this cross and experience forgiveness, we become new creations. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. 
We need to daily lay down our burdens, our, our, our sinful life, and step through into forgiveness into Christ. We need to come to the cross and die to self and its sinful desires, and then we will find that we're truly alive in Jesus. In your pamphlet that I, in that outline that I gave you today, I have over on the cro- over on the side on the next slide there, um, this freedom and redemption, and what I've been enjoying as I come to that point in the in the cross, I I come and I, I like to look through those passages in my prayer. And I like to read those passages while I pray because I'm giving thanks to God for for his redemption, for the freedom that I have through the cross, that I have through Christ. I'm a new creation in Christ. And I have a few more there, but I'm going to I'm gonna skip through them. But but he became sin so that I could be free. Jesus became sin that I so that I could be made right with him. Um, we see that in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And it's because of the blood of Jesus that I have redemption and freedom in Ephesians 1, 7. In him, we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sin in accordance with the richness of God's grace. There is so much more that we can pray through at this point in our tabernacle. We can pray um, for giving thanks to God for his blood that washes us clean. And I have verses there about that. But as I've been experiencing this idea of walking through the tabernacle in prayer, I find that I can pray for for hours because I can go through these passages and I can give thanks to God. And I can be excited about his forgiveness. So I had to break this into a couple weeks because I knew you didn't want to be here for hours, or maybe some of you did. (laughs) But the next item, once you've come through forgiveness, once you've passed that brazen altar, once you've come to the cross, we see this, 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 this item of furniture called a laver. And this laver was a washing basin. And in Exodus chapter 38, verse eight, It says, Moses was instructed to make the washing basin out of mirrors from the women at the tent of meetings. So he was to take (coughs) these bronze mirrors that the women used, and he was to construct this laver. And I was talking to Pastor George about it, and he goes, well, I thought they just always melted those down and then made this bowl. And I thought, well, that's what I've always thought too, but every other item that Moses was instructed to use, he was instructed to take gold and make the items in the holy places. He was instructed to take the the bronze and make the brazen altar. But in this, it was particular. It was to take these mirrors in Exodus chapter 38, verse 8, and make this brazen altar. And so I thought that was super, super interesting to me because I think once we've come through the cross, we still need to come and reflect on who we are in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 says, But we all with unveiled faces behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. And are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. The laver is a place where we allow God's word to shine upon us, to reflect back to us how we are to conduct ourselves and to live. As we look at the laver, we see a mirror. And that's why I have a mirror sitting back there. Because as you look at that mirror, you see a reflection. Now when you get up in the morning and uh, my <laughs> you look in that mirror, um, some of us see all the imperfections. 
You know, my, my daughter, I don't know if I'll get away with this in the second service because she'll be here, but my daughter, she has just discovered makeup. And uh, she likes to look at that mirror and she can spend forever gazing at the mirror because she wants to hide the imperfections, right? Right, ladies? That's what we do. You do. I, I, you got all my imperfections right here out for display. <laughs> but uh, I want you to look at that in this time of prayer, when you come to that laver, to look at the mirror of God's word. To look in that mirror and do you see Christ or do you see your imperfections? Because we are becoming like Christ. We are, are to be being molded into the image of Christ. And so on one hand, we, we see this place of reflecting. We also see a place of washing. That this was the place the priests would come and wash themselves, make themselves clean before they entered into that holy place. And washing, I see in Psalm 139, in verse 23, where the psalmist cries out, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. This, this idea of searching for who we are in Christ and allowing God's word to wash over us. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 4, we are not trying to impress men, but God who tests our hearts. This washing. You see, someone said it earlier, prayer is a two-way conversation. It's a two-way communication. And as we come into our prayer life, we need to take God's word with us because this is how he communicates to us. And as we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. So I want you to take a moment now and to look at the reflection of Christ. Sorry, look at the reflection in the laver and who do you see? Do you see you and your desires or do you see Christ? Or do you see a little glimmer of maybe both? And you can take this time to pray that you can become more like Christ. And then that flap that folds shut, there was some verses about who we are in Christ. Allow the promises of scripture that are there to assure you as you wash in the word of who you are in Christ, you're forgiven. You're a child of the Most High. You have been set free. And take a moment and reflect and look at who you are in Christ. And at this time, as we bow our heads and do that, I would just like to use this as an opportunity for people to cry out if they want and just maybe one sentence prayers in thanksgiving to God for who we are in Christ. Giving thanks to him as we journey through this tabernacle. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Father, I thank you that uh, as Byron was teaching about the mirrors and the laver, I think that that also uh, brings to mind the idea that when we look in those mirrors being reflected back at us, well, that allows us to see ourselves as we are as we come before you. And, mm. Mm. And I thank you for this message on prayer, keeping in mind that uh, in Revelation 5, uh, verse 8, uh, it talks about the 24 elders bowing down before the Lamb, and what they had in their hands were the bowl, bowls of incense, which were the prayers of the saints. It wasn't about the deeds that we did, it wasn't about anything else. 
Amen. 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 Mm. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father, for forgiveness. As we look upon this, we know that we are humans who make mistakes, and yet we're forgiven because we can see the reflection of the cross. We are becoming like you, and so, Father, I pray that you would make us more like yourself, make you make us more like your Son. And Lord Jesus, I pray that as we strive to transform into your image, as we strive to become more like you, that you would give us strength. And that as we spend time in your word, that you would speak to us and show us your will. Put on us the desires of your heart so that as we pray for the desires of our heart, it would be the desires of your heart. I just pray this in your precious name. Amen. You see, this model, I have just found it has brought to life my prayer life over this last little while. The, the, last, thing, the, the, uh, the last thing that I see with this laver is a desire for obedience or a, a command of obedience because we see that it is also, in, in the New Testament, we are, we are told to be baptized. Once we've come to the cross, we are to be washed. We're to, to, to walk in this, um, this element, this symbol of baptism, this symbol of obedience. And over the summer, we're going to be talking with people and, and, uh, and, looking for those of you who desire to follow God in, in obedience, in baptism. And if you, that is something that God is challenging you to do, then, then in your prayer life and in your, in your walk with God, look into it and discover why we need to be baptized, why we need to be washed and follow Christ in this, um, in this way. But in my own personal life, I've been baptized, but I still need to walk in obedience. And so when I come to this laver, I think of the obedience that I need before I come to God. So I want to encourage you to take that pamphlet that's in your book, in, in, your, in your book, in, in your bulletin. It's almost like a book lately. Uh, but take that home and tuck that into your Bible. And uh, as you can see, it took a little while to construct. And... Um, so take that and put it into your Bible. And this week when you're praying, I would encourage you to, 
to do that again, to come to the gate and give thanks to God, to enter into his gates with thanksgiving in your heart. As you come to the altar, experience the forgiveness of Christ every day. Bring your, bring your, your sins, conve- con- confess them to God and ask him for the strength to, to continue in your walk with God. And then as you come to this laver, take some time to reflect. Maybe that'll be in the first thing when you come in the and you look in that mirror in the morning and you look, take some time to reflect and and see, okay, am I just gonna see my imperfections or am I gonna see Christ who's living in and through me and am I gonna make a difference in the world this week? And then take some time and reflect on God's word and have allow him to wash you in his word. And then next week, we will continue our prayer journey as we go into the tabernacle, as we go into that holy place and we worship God. Let us, worship team, would you come and lead us in one last song?